Okay. Hello everyone, welcome to the weekly Jenkins Infrastructure Team Meeting. Um, so today we are five person. We have a guest, Tian Studer. Uh, we have Stefan Hervé, Mark and I. Hello. So let's get started. Uh, first announcement. So the weekly release to point three to five has been released. The checklists have to be completed. Uh, the main element, if I remember correctly, oh, it's written, perfect. Um, plugin manager UI, uh, big changes to to improve the ex user experience. Um, so yeah, don't know if there are other major changes, Mark. Um, a number of a number of internal improvements that have been have been queued and and working through. So. Um, lots of lots of refactoring that happened, lots of warning improvements, that kind of thing. Okay, thanks. So that should be available on all your, um, let's say, staging and test environment before end of day. <laughs> are there is no, are there any other announcements? Not okay. So let's start. So the first point. Welcome, Etienne. So. I will let you the mic. We will discuss about the subject of accelerating CI Jenkins IO builds uh, and tests mainly with using Gradle Enterprise Suite. So Mark drive the subject and Etienne, our guest is here to, to show us things. Great, well, thank you very much then. <laughs> so I'll share my screen. Um, I have a, a few slides that I would like to share to give you a bit of context, but I also want to give you a bit of a demo as well. Right? So it will be and I'll try to keep an eye on the, on the watch that we don't run out of time. So again, my name is Etienne, I'm from Gradle, I'm the SVP of engineering of the Gradle Enterprise team. Um, I have a French name, but I'm from Switzerland and I speak Swiss German usually. So please don't, don't ask me in, in French at the end of this presentation. Um, I might get a bit in trouble. Um, so first of all, what are we trying to, what tr problem are we trying to solve? Just to have, give you a little bit of context before we dive into specifics of Gradle Enterprise. So what we often see, for years now already and still see it is three different things uh, amongst many others of course things take too long right we make a small change we expect to get quick feedback but we wait way too long we lose the flow we, we switch context and and we also um, um, accumulate more changes more more potential for failures because things take too long and we start doing something else um, things also take too long to fix um, both for local developers or for engineers, but also for infrastructure teams or build teams. Because if we don't know what is going on, what went wrong, it's really hard to, to fix it. Right? First, you need to know what is happening um, without just guesswork um, and without having to reproduce what hopefully will happen again in order to debug. Right? You want to jump right to, ah, this is what happened. Okay, I know how to fix this. Right? Um, and the third category is more like, is the category of things could have been prevented in the sense that you run some builds, it fails, a developer comes to you and says, yeah, of course, this happens from time to time, just rerun the build and you'll be fine. Could be a local build, but could also be a CI build. I'm sure everybody has experienced that, um, that we're just clicking the run button again because we know sooner or later it will pass. Right? And this is all, all creating inefficiency and making us less productive. And if you add that up for a whole year for multiple developers, and that doesn't matter if it's a commercial company or an open source project, it really reduces your productivity significantly and it bumps up your costs, um, wasted costs. Right? So with Quill Enterprise, we can do different things and I'll, and I'll show it in, in, in practice in a second. First one, we can really surface what happened in your build because we collect what happened in your build in, with great detail, whether it's a Basil build, a Maven build or a Gradle build, does not matter. It works exactly the same way. And we can capture that data while the build is running, upload it to the Gradle Enterprise server, and then that data becomes available to, to be visualized, to be ana analyzed and so on. And we can do this for local builds as well as for CI builds. And that's a, it's an important point, right? Because if you just have the server, yes, then you can look at the CI builds, what happened, typically based on logs, but we can do the same for local builds. And it's not just based on log, it's much, a much richer model, right? And what that allows us to do is we can really do a, a fast root cause analysis. What was going on, like I mentioned, and then, we can, we can start addressing it. We can also collaborate efficiently. If something goes wrong, I need help, for example, from the infra team and I'll build locally. I don't have to explain what I did exactly and what machine was I using and so on. 
I can just share the data visualized and the infra team, for example, will be very quickly understanding what was going on and they can focus on the solution and not on what was I trying to do, right? The same if I want to collaborate with another developer and I'll show you in a second. Um, and some investigations, even if it's on CI, I can do on my own. If my build's failing, it's passing locally, but not on CI, well, I can already take a look at what happened on CI in the visualization that I mentioned. And it might be, oh, a new um, snapshot dependency was pulled in and that was causing my, my, my problem, right? I don't need to ping the, the infra team to, to ask for, for assistance in such a case. Um, so that also saves some resource. Um, and also, in, especially I think in the open source world, everybody's time is limited. Uh, we, uh, those, except those that are doing it full time, they do it in, well, they do it in their spare time. And they, they, if they want to, if they tackle something, they want to do this efficiently. They're not going to say, oh, I'm going to investigate this nasty issue, but I already know it's going to take so many, so much time. So they might not even start that. So let me just show you that aspect. So that is what we call the build scan. And you can see it here. Um, it captures a lot of data, visualizes it. You can also export it via an API um, and it provides all kinds of details. And I just picked this from an open source instance that uh, is the XWiki project. And what you can see is I can dive all the way into, into, for example, dependencies and I can quickly see what was going on. Ah, this is what I'm pulling in. It's exactly that snapshot version. That might be the cause of my problem, right? Or I might not know. So I can just take that link and I can share with others, right? I can take that link and I can say, hey, I don't know what the problem is, but my colleague might know, or maybe somebody from the infrastructure team, I just share that link. You can go there and you see exactly what I'm looking at. Um, and you will see much more, right? You will see uh, in, with what hardware did I run it? What switches did I have on? What were actual, the actual goal that I was running and so on. So all these things are already answered and you can quickly dive into the details. What was the build doing? Of course, that includes also testing, dependencies, which plugins were applied. I can even add my own data. And of course, the, the, the log itself is also available, right? but that is the, the least interesting because it's basically yeah, just the, the plain text. But even here, I could link, I could share, ask for help, and, and, and really efficiently collaborate with others. Right? So, so that's the, the insights part. Then if we move on fast feedback cycles, yeah, I think everybody that does development knows that situation. You make a small change, you want to get fee some, uh, quick feedback, but usually you make a small change and you have to wait quite a long time to get get the feedback whether that change was sound or not, right? Um, but if we can achieve that the feedback cycles get fast um, because the build is doing less work because it only does the work it needs to and not all the work all the time, we can run our build more often. We can make smaller changes and get the quick feedback. Was that a good change or not? And because it's so quick, we will also do this more often, right? And if we do things more often, this also puts less constraints or, or less uh, strains on um, CI, right? Um, but not only for local development, things get more fluid. Also, when you push those changes to CI and you want them to be deployed to some testing server or so, or some staging server, um, if the build is faster, it will the, the changes will go through the pipelines faster, right? And be in the end, be deployed faster to a staging environment or even to, to a production environment, right? And one thing that I, is, I find extremely important, especially in the open source world is if, if I'm a contributor and, and I want to make uh, maybe just a very small change, maybe even a typo somewhere that I saw in the Java doc or in a, in a method, in an API, um, I want to make that change as quickly as possible. So what do I do? I check out the project and first I build it. And after I build it, I'll make the change. Um, but if it takes me, if it takes the checkout is class, but then it takes me like half an hour, an hour to build the project. And I haven't even touched the project yet. I mean, I'm sure many people will just stop there and say, ah, I'm, I'm not going to contribute. It's not worth fixing a few typos or, or even making some small refactorings to the code or a feature if it takes me so long to even build the project the first time, right? And that's also something we can address where we, and I, I will show you a concrete example right now. So um, faster feedback cycles, one way to approach it is by saying, let's not do work we've done before. And that's on the level of a goal. So if I've done a, executed a goal before, with exactly the same inputs, so the same sources, for example, the same JDM version and so on, depending on the goal, of course, uh, I can reuse that output that was produced instead of re rerunning that goal. And we see this, I took as an example, the Spring Boot build. I ran this locally a few days ago. Um, I, had, I had checked it out fresh 
right? And many things did not have to be run again because they've already built on CI. They've already put in the cache by CI. You can see it here, right? And what that meant is that the whole build to execute all the tasks took two minutes, right? The full build is about 40 or 50 minutes. So if I'm also, if I'm looking at how much am I actually saving when I ran this locally, I saved almost three hours. Why? So the build will not have taken three hours. That's because they run the build also in parallel with multiple threads. But still, I'm, I'm going down to, to two minutes from something like 40 or 50 minutes, right? And that is a really low bar for me to say, yes, I want to contribute to that project if I just want to make a small change and I don't want to make a big investment of running a build for an hour. Maybe it even fails after an hour just to make a small change. Right? So I think that's, a, especially in the open source world, an, an important thing to keep in mind. Um, so then lower CI resource consumption, that is, in my opinion, a, a nice, um, almost like a side effect, but I think it's a very important one. And I see this more and more happening that just scaling horizontally at some point becomes really expensive. And so what we can do or what happens is if we skip goals because we have executed them already with exactly the same inputs and, and then we save ourselves the resources of recompiling or rerunning the tests or regenerating Java doc or regenerating source code if we generate um, like for source code them um, dynamically. Um, and so that saves resources, right? If we can skip tests that we don't need to run because we know these tests are not going to affect or not going to be affected by the change I made, well, we again save resources because we, can, because we just skipped work. Right? Also, if the build feedback cycles get faster that I mentioned before, and we now start running builds more often locally, instead of always just pushing to CI and say, oh, CI is gonna take care. We're also putting less um, weight on CI. And as a nice side effect of, of that as well, if we start building more often locally, what we will push to CI will be higher quality. We've already tested it locally, at least verified to, to some degree, right? That means to less, that means it will have red, less red builds on CI, meaning, Red builds need to be rerun after they're fixed, right? So we can save ourselves these extra cycles of red builds to some degree if we start building more locally and having the, the higher quality that we push. Right. Um, another effect is um, if we get our builds more stable, right? If we have, for example, flaky tests, every time we have a flaky test and that runs on CI and it fails, well, we have to rerun that build, the entire build typically, right? So we can also reduce um, hardware consumption in that sense if we make our builds more stable. And so when a, when a test should be green, it's always gonna be green and it's not gonna fail sometime, right? And again, I wanna show an example on, on that part. Um, I'm using the Spring project again. Um, so they also use Gradle Enterprise uh, as an open source project where we sponsor an instance. And you can see here for the Spring Boot build, all the CI builds I filtered by those over the last 28 days. And you can see they also have some flaky tests. I think every project has flaky tests. I've not seen one that didn't, um, but that's okay. And usually we have more flaky tests than we have time to fix. So which one should we fix? We need the data to make a good decision. And that's what we get here because we collected all the, the flaky test data for all the builds or basically the test data for all the builds. We can also see which ones are the most flaky and I can slice it and dice it as I want, right? I went by CI, by project, but I could also use other dimensions. Right? And then I see, oh, this one is the most flaky one. It usually runs for 12 minutes, ooh, that's pretty expensive. Every time it runs and it might fail even though it shouldn't, that's it. So it ran for 12 minutes just to then fail when it shouldn't fail. And in the end, the whole build fails, right? And so if I wanna address this problem, I will probably address this one first because it's the most flakiness. It is the most flaky of, of all the tests they have, right? So, so I have the data, I can make an informed decision, I can make the fix and I can, I can then verify it again. And then um, hopefully I see an improvement, right? For example, you see it was more flaky in the past, then it went down, but it's still flaky sometimes, but most of the time it's green, right? So I can even see the trend. Is it getting more flaky or less? All right. So then going back, just so, so how do you install, I guess from the infrastructure team, you're also interested um, in, in how, do you, how do you run this? So basically you have a great enterprise server. It's a piece of software that you install or we host it and in that we can discuss that. And it comes with all these components. So the build scans, that's what I showed in the visualization. We have the build cache. We can also run tests distributed across many machines. And we can also do analysis over many builds. That's what you see, what, yeah, what I showed you with the test um, analytics, for example. Um, and on the client side, basically whether you're, um, 
whether you are on CI, which is in that sense also a client of, of Gradle Enterprise or a developer, the build just points to Gradle Enterprise, captures the data while it's running, pushes it to, to Gradle Enterprise at the end, and that's it. Caching happens, works similarly. The developer runs the build and the build, Gradle Enterprise checks, can I use it from the cache or not? And if so, it pulls it from the cache. And on CI, you not only read from the cache, but you also push to the cache. So local developers typically don't push to the cache. Usually that's disabled that the, or, or yeah, not, the permissions are not granted. So only CI pushes to the cache, but everybody can reuse. You can reuse it in your pipeline. You can use it in consecutive steps of the pipeline and developers can also benefit. So for example, I come into the office in the morning, I run the build like I showed you with Spring and it took everything from the cache. And that will be basically always happening when I, when I do a Git pull and have no local changes everything will come from the cache. You have some changes, only those things that are not affected by that change would then be taken from the cache, right? Um, so yes, I showed the build scans. I want to just emphasize that the caching in Gradle Enterprise happens on the level of a goal. So not on the whole build, not on the whole, on the level of a Git commit, it's on the level of, the, of, of a single goal. So it's very fine grained, but that means with every build, you will get some, you will get some caches and the, le the less, Changes you made, you typically the more you get from the cache. Test distribution that is of course not one, not a component where you um, save um, resources. But if you have to run tests because something has changed, you can distribute the work across multiple agents, um, and then collect the, the the results or will be collected, and the, the build continues of course much faster. So if you have ten agents, each one runs uh, hundred tests of a thousand total tests. Well, you can, you can expect that your overall test goal will be done 10 times faster. Um, and then we have predictive test selection. That's that's something we're working on. We were releasing the first preview uh, this week, actually. Um, th that's the idea. Well, if I make a change, I don't need to run all the tests. I only need to run those tests that are very likely to be broken by what I just changed. Because if I change, just run a test that is not even affected by that change, well, I can save myself running that test. And that is based not on like code traversal or so, it's based on historic data. And we have a very high hit rate um, and it comes with considerable savings, right? If we don't have to te run tests unnecessarily. Of course, you can conditionally turn it on and off. So if you say, well, I have a release build there, I always want to test or run all the tests. Yes, you can do that. But you could say like for a Git um, pull request there, I don't want to run all the tests. I just want to run those likely affected by the change. Um, how is it deployed? It's deployed into Kubernetes cluster. It supports horizontal scaling. It runs at the, some of the biggest companies or software engineering teams in the world, you know, like Netflix and LinkedIn and, and several others. Um, also banking, banks and so on with thousands of, of users. Um, so it scales really, it's not, not, that, that's not gonna be the issue. Um, you can also use an external database in instead of an embedded database. Um, so that's also possible. And you can run multiple cache nodes. So if you have people on different continents, you can also say I have multiple cache nodes and they can even replicate. So you could say CI pushes to the cache in, in I'm just making this up in the US and then it pushes all the entries automatically to the one in Europe, the one in Asia. And so when people in Europe access a cache node to get some entries, it's already there. They don't have to get it in the US. Right? So this is pretty advanced. Um, what would you have to do on the on the project? Let's. Uh, I talked with Mark about using the Jenkins core project to get started. Um, all you would have to do um, just to get up and running is well, once the server is running, at gdosjenkins.io, um, add extensions on XML where we refer to the Gradle Enterprise Maven extension. You add a Gradle um, dash Enterprise XML point to that server. You can also configure a few a uh, few details about uh, what you exactly want to capture and so on. But that's it. You check that in, and from then on, every build, one CI or locally, will capture the build scan, will publish it, um, and you get all the analytics, you get the build caching, etc. And I mentioned on CI, you would also want to push to the cache. So whenever you build on CI, push the artifacts of compile and test and Java doc and so on. And so on. Um, so there you would also inject the, the credentials to write to the build cache. While reading, you would leave anonymous um, access. So everybody can read the entry, right, but not write. So, and that, that's pretty much it. Um, but we would not just say, here's here's a, the server um, or here's the license and, and now they connect your builds and we're done. And we would really help you um, get the most out of it, right? And this maybe looks a bit, I don't know, scary, but it's not, right? There's an installation part, then it's configuring the build to connect to Gradle Enterprise. Then we would measure where we are today, but this is really more from, for the commercial side. I mean, but still it would be interesting to see where are you today? Then we would help you optimize um, the build to get the most out of the build cache. 
Um, and we can measure then again, we can measure it, um, a delta and that's it. Well, all right, that, that is more like on the commercial side. Right? But that, that this is really the idea. We use the tool itself to measure its value and it's not based on qualitative value it's, or qualitative metrics, it's really quantitative metrics. Um, but even then you would not be done or, I mean, it, it is not considered done because it's like cleaning up a room. You have to clean it up from time to time. Otherwise you're gonna have a mess again. I think it's the same here. So we also have some, some that visualizations to make sure where is my build time going? Is it going up and down? How am I using the build cache? And so for what are the most common failures? For example, you have a, somebody says, oh, I have an error on CI. I have this every day. You're like, you're sure? I don't think so. Well, then you have this guesswork. With Quail Enterprise, you can find all the builds with similar failures and it will tell you, ah, it's only on that one agent or it's only um, locally by that user uh, or whatever it is, right? So again, you will have data to make informed decisions. And if you're not sure, you can always share, use the links and share with your colleagues. You can also compare two bills to see why is not something taken from the cache when it should be, and it will give you a nice diff. And from there, it's usually really easy to, to find out because the, the key is always knowing what happened because once you know, you can react to it. Right, uh, we have a lot of customers, so, but that's, that's not relevant um, in this case. But we also have other open source Gradle Enterprise uh, um, instances running, right? And this is the current list. So you see Spring was one of the first, JetBrains Kotlin compilers using it, JUnit, Spock, test containers, a lot of projects in the, in the testing space. Um, we also have Micrometer, it's also Hibernate, um, and also the Micronaut Foundation. They're also using Great Enterprise across their AD projects. Um, yeah, and, and some, oh, it's listed twice, and so on, right? And some use it with Gradle, some use it with Maven. It works exactly the same way. Um, we also did it for the Jenkins project. So I asked Mark, well, what would we do first? And he, he said, we would do the, the core project first. So we ran an experiment. We took the project, we checked it out. We ran the full build with tests. So, and we tried to use the same configuration that you had in your, what we think is your configuration that you run on CI. And it took an hour and 12 minutes. Right? And I can show you the build scan. And then we ran it again with Gradle Enterprise enabled. We, we um, added um, some additional annotations to make it clear for Gradle Enterprise what our inputs and, and what, what our outputs. And in the best case scenario where you run the build twice and you don't make a change between, it goes from one hour, 12 minutes to one minute and two seconds. So again, we can, uh, we can measure that. So let me show you, you can see here um, to finish off my, my part here. Um, it was using the build cache um, and ran not many goals because many came from the cache. Right. And so if we look at what came from the cache, these are all the things that came from the cache. Right. So that's what I briefly wanted to show here as well. Um, that that the the, um, the savings you can expect are um, very significant. Um, and that's pretty much what I wanted to wanted to show you today. So I'd be uh, very happy if you're interested in in, in proceeding from here. Um, to, to try out Great Enterprise with one of your projects. So, so thanks very much, Etienne. I'm, I'm especially delighted that you ran the experiment with the Jenkins core. That was, now, now I'm interested in the behavior on as soon as a, so the, the 72 minutes to two minutes, really great. That's marvelous. Now the question then is, when the first change arrives, that's the place where I was most interested in, all right, somebody submitted a pull request to change some piece. Uh, you noted that would, that would then take some advantage of the cache, but of course it'd have to rebuild some pieces. And so it's certainly not going to be two minutes. The hope yeah. is it will be somewhere between 72 minutes and two minutes and we get benefit from the cache. Yep, yes, okay. exactly. So. Gradle Enterprise will only build what, what is needed to be built. Um, so if you make a change, depending on what that change is, how, how rippling it is, it will have to do more or less work. That's correct. Um, so it is the best case scenario, but I would still keep in mind that this best case scenario also happens quite often. Like I said, if you check out a new version from Git and you commit state, you have no local changes, you build it, it will apply. Or you run the, the GitHub, the pull request, and then you merge it and you run it again on master. You basically have the same code. You run, you run the same thing. It can just take everything from the cache. So there are still many scenarios where the best case scenarios kicks in, 
And even if the best case scenario doesn't kick in, it's somewhere between the two minutes, yes, and, and the hour and 12 minutes in, in, in the case that we measured here, yes. Yeah. And, and great Lampas will tell you, like we have a performance dashboard where you see over the last, for example, 28 days on CI, how much savings did we get from the cash? So to the rest of the team, I assume ge.jenkins.io is a thing that you hosted and that you could host for this prototype. To Damien and Hervé, I assume that would mean we would have to do something in terms of DNS to, to allow such a thing. What other questions do the rest of the team have? I, I've, I've run out of my questions, others. Okay. So thanks for, uh, for that presentation. That's really appealing. So I have also a few questions. So the first one, um, we have a specificity on the case of CI Jenkins IO is the fact that since it's a public facing Jenkins instance and we don't have mechanisms such as the GitHub token on GitHub action, we consider all credential on that instance potentially compromised every day. That means uh, everything that is built, so all the, the CI, pure CI, no generation of artifact that are published somewhere, all the build and test only phases are provided to developer for their feedbacks. Um, that means developer cannot push the cache. That would be too dangerous for us given the amount of contributor we have there. So that means the cache generation, is it possible? Uh, I understand that yes, based on your presentation, but I will want to be sure that I understand correctly. That means we could have a private instance that run the source code. So it's a, something really uh, private and secure that should push to the cache only, while another Jenkins instance, that big one public facing, could benefit from that generated cache. Is my understanding correct? Yep. Okay. So and, Damien, yep. just to be sure I've understood. So then, then the idea then would be ci.jenkins.io would not push to cache. We would have yes. something else that would push to cache. Exactly. Uh, it, it may not give us as as hot a cache as as if ci.jenkins.io were doing it, but it avoids the risk of someone doing an attack where they submit something and poison the cache by. Exactly, okay. that, that, that's the, the the risk here. Uh, the attack vector will be clearly this one. Um, I understand that we should see some benefits, but will we have the same benefits as the incrementals one that you described, like? We open a pull request or a few pull requests a lot during a single day. Let's say we update the cache hourly or maybe all the six or eight hours. Are we still able to benefit from the uh, when we have frequent tiny changes? Yep, it's a, um, it's a good, good point. And um, so what I did not go into, but there is there's both a local and a remote cache. So there's a cache you can share between users, and then there's one local to the machine. Um, so let's say kind of worst case, you had no remote cache, you would still benefit from a local cache when you switch branches or you, you make updates and you roam again. So that's something you would still have. Um, but even if you have the remote cache on and you do the scenario that you described, yes, you lose a little bit in that case where you said, okay, I'm pull request and I merge to master because likely between those two builds, the private instance will not populate the cache. Um, I'm not sure how you reuse the agents. So for example, if you run multiple builds on an agent oh. before destroying it, then you could. No, also we don't. It. We don't reuse agent at all, or our agent are ephemeral and one shot, um, yeah. initially yeah. for cost reasons, but also to help on the security, even if it's not enough. We, uh, yeah. I would say, safety instead. But all these machines, except really, really specific exception, all the machines are either virtual machines on the cloud or containers on Kubernetes. And it's on two different cloud provider. So we yeah. don't have the network locality. So in a deployment scenario, we will need two geographical location, one on Azure and one on AWS. So depending on the kind, we will have a close uh, cache near to the agents. Yep, yep. Yeah, so I would expect that you don't see the same high benefits, but I would expect you still see the benefits. And again, if you try it, you will be able to measure it. That's the good thing. It's not, I mean, right now it's a bit of a guess, but um, it will not be. And of course, let's say a developer that, that contributes and checks out once a day or maybe once every few days, they will still get all the benefits when they, when they pull from, from, from Git and then run the build and it gets it from the cache. 
I also had a question. So I, I don't know, uh, since you have a lot of metrics, do you have feedbacks about the, the benefits costs of running your own service and cache versus downloading everything? Because in our case, installing the service, meaning hosting a database, having a file system block storage that will grow with the cache size plus the multiple installation that will cost us some, let's say, CPU cycle on both clouds. And in the end, since our goal is to decrease the build time, do you have some metrics about, okay, if you host on Azure, then it's better than Amazon because the cost balance benefits between the time of spending on one hour of AWS T3 medium. I don't know if you have such metrics because that one is tricky to measure and that could, we need at yeah. least one month of running it in a real life scenario, not, not on a single point to be able yeah. to measure if it's worth it. Yes. Um, so for that, I don't have an answer because to be honest, so far, everybody that's using Great Enterprise uh, we, and wasn't hosted internally, they're using AWS. And that's the, but, but there we also see some differences in that some, some use bigger machines, some use smaller machine. And also there is the question, well, do you really need the higher machine? I mean, it's at some point, it's pretty hard to quantify. Um, but, I, but my experience is also the costs are not so big that it really makes a huge difference whether you're then using A or B, right? So, and yeah, what, we often see, sorry, so what, what I also often see is that, yes, there's also an overhead in getting things from the cache because it needs to download it, it needs to extract it. But when you compare it to a goal that runs for five minutes or even an hour, hmm. it becomes negligible. That is kind of there. So there's some cost, but usually it's negligible, yeah. Okay, I was just asking in case you already had metrics. Um, no. if, if we can totally provide what we can measure on our experiment in any case, uh, most of the infrastructure is open and transparent. So if you're interested on these feedbacks, we can try to measure. Of course, in that measurement, it's only infra pure infrastructure and eventually sysops measurement time, how much we cost per hour or something. Yeah. But it doesn't measure the, the value that you presented for the developer not having to wait. Even if we are not the company with all the contributor, we cannot measure the developer productivity here, but still uh, it's, it's really nearly scoped what I'm uh, picking off, of course, because uh, uh, the developer experience and they don't have to wait one hour, this one is hard to value in terms of money, but it's still a good value to provide. So. It's just, I'm asking and uh, we can provide measure because we will try that will be still a uh, data point, interesting data point on that part. Yep. And just give you a rough number. I mean, we host some instances, right? And what they call, we host them all in Kubernetes cluster. It's the same cluster. All those 15 instances minus two, Spring and JetBrains hosted themselves, but all the other ones we host. So that's 13 instances and they cost us around um, $130 per month per instance. So it's it's not it's not a lot of yeah oh, that's okay yeah. It's, it's not um, a lot of money of well, course as you add more data and maybe you have much more load than than the number increases but this is a an average number for our instances okay but that that's a good uh, order of magnitude um, another question about the installation let's say we have a Kubernetes cluster to host most of the persistent services such as the database the proxy um, and all the the element the key cloak and stuff. Uh, let's say we have another Kubernetes cluster on another cloud provider, uh, in our case, Azure and Amazon. Um, we tend to separate physically the Kubernetes cluster. And on Amazon, we only run ephemeral agents where the builds happen. So that means we will need at least one or two local nodes that provide a cache or any metrics or probes that are used. Is it possible to have such deployment? Like some components are outside the main Kubernetes cluster where you have the database? Yes, in general, that, that is definitely possible. I don't want to go too far because I'm not the infrastructure expert. Okay, but no problem. We have no. situations. You also are able to run a cache node, not as a Kubernetes, but just as a standalone Docker image that is also possible. And okay. So, but, but what, what I've seen is usually when the constraints were given by the Kubernetes, how, how restrictive the Kubernetes cluster was configured and not by what Great Enterprise supported or not, because in the end, it's just HTTP requests across okay. networks. Fair. Mm, I think that answer. And um, my last question is, um, 
um, how uh, is there a possibility to remove from cache a specific artifact? Because that's a scenario we have quite often. We generate an artifact that, for good and bad reasons, ends up being a jar file with a size of zero bytes. That file is uploaded to the cache we have currently. Uh, most of the time, we need to create a new release and update all the dependency chain uh, because we cannot clear remove from our uh, homemade cache. Is it a feature? Because that feature is costing a lot of developer headache. Uh, is it something that is provided on the offer? Like, I want to remove specifically that artifact or that version of the artifact? Yes. So, the, the, and the way it works, as you would see in the build scan, the, the visualization I showed, you would see, oh, this goal ran created a jar doesn't look right, you will see what, what the cache key is of, of, of that, that entry. Um, you can go to the cache admin UI or query enterprise, you can enter that cache key. You can say delete and it will delete it from all the nodes. Cool, Yeah. nice feature. These are the four questions I had. I don't know for Hervé, Stefan or Mark, if you have others, but thanks for your answers. Thank you for the question. Um, Etienne, you had mentioned to me licensing, and that was one, if I remember right, that needs somebody with signature authority, and that I'll probably have to take to the Jenkins Governance Board, because the, the infra team certainly does not have authorization to sign something on behalf of, of a legal entity. Um, yep. So, but, but that, I, anything you need to share there on licensing that you and I can work it separately, I think, without without a lot of complication there. I've, I'm now a member of the governance board, so uh, I'll certainly take it to them. Yep. Yes. So it's, it's more like a technicality. I mean, we see this as a collaboration. And it's not like, you know, I mean, we, we're offering this, right? So it's we just need something for kind of the worst case scenario where, I don't know, you invited Microsoft to use that instance for free or something, right? I'm just making right. it. So it's really just for the worst case scenarios that we want to be, uh, we need something because we're yeah, you know, commercial only in the end. Um, but we've done before. So we have a standard terms as well that we can use as a basis. So um, I think it's just a formality in the end to, to work that part out. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Great. Thank you, Etienne. Thanks yep. very much. Thanks very much. I think I think that concludes next steps. As far as I can tell, is engage with you to to or let me. Do we need a separate conversation, Damien, Hervé, and Stefan, or is it okay if we I start the next steps of working the discussion with the governance board and we'll discuss internally? Yeah, I, I think we can totally start the conversation with the governance board and the developer. So the goal you now is to be sure that our developers see value. Uh, the, if there is no override, if they are okay. On the infrastructure side, I mean, we don't mind providing a new tool because we see it could be valuable, but we are not the person that really developed and use and waits for their builds every day. So here, the value for us as infrastructure is if you can help the developer and if you can even help us a bit, that's okay. But the cost here for us is to have to manage the solution. It sounds good on the paper, given the answer you and the presentation you gave. Uh, I mean, we can install on Kubernetes and uh, eventually uh, distribute some cache. There is the test part. I understand there is a part that might be or, or is hosted on your own for the metrics analytics. I assume that you have something on no, that part? No, either it will all be with you or all will be okay. with us. Right? There's no share, there's no split. Okay. So, and uh, Etienne, if it would be okay with you, I'd like to plan for, and it may have to be after the first of the, after the new year, um, yeah. a developer online meetup where we have you present much of the same things that you've done for us here but with a developer-centered idea so that they can come and ask questions and say, hey, what about this? What about this? Your data that you gave what looked like a great piece. I would ask for one or two more pieces of data in terms of, hey, I evaluated this pull request. It took this much extra time, this much time so that they've got that in that answer. But would you be okay doing a, an, an online meetup, probably 60 to 90 minutes, the first 45 minutes or so presentation mode with relatively few questions, and then we'll switch to Q&A mode and high interaction. Would you be willing to do that? Sure. Okay, great. 
all right, so I will, I will propose that and go looking for a time when, when it works for us. We usually need at least two weeks of, of, of alert to the community. And given the, the end of your holidays, that means it'll probably be early January before we can yeah. do it. It's better than, yeah, better than that. Cool. Great, well, thank, thank you. For the opportunity. Thank you to, very to much. Thank you. Thank you. So exciting and um, we'll stay in touch, I guess. <laughs> Excellent, thanks Etienne. I'll let you go. Thanks. Bye. All right. Bye. Thanks very Bye. much. Thanks. So, Damien, I think we still have topics we need to cover. Are you okay if I go back yes. to sharing my screen, or you want yes. to share? Okay. Uh, let me share. Here we go. Oops, wrong. Yes, one. I propose, given that we are a bit over time, uh, we go over the important part is the account uh, Jenkins IO discussion from log 4 shell and if it's okay for everyone. I don't see other emergency or high priority to pick outside this one. So I propose that we delay the, all the normal operation elements either to the day today or to next weekly team, if it's okay for everyone. Unless you have a high priority topics outside log for shell The log for shell is the one thing that was on my mind and accounts.jenkins.io is the one on my mind. Yep. Okay, so let's go. So first of all, um, public thanks to um, Hervé, Marc, uh, and Stefan also for the work you did. I wasn't available during last week uh, for the work you did to assist the security team that we can also give many credit and thanks uh, for the rapid response analysis, for helping on all the sites. So really a big thanks. I wasn't available at all. And I mean, I wasn't worried a minute given the work that everyone did, even if it's a worrying subject. So. Really, many thanks for all of you for the works put there. Um, so just a point, so thanks. So Hervé, it sounds like confirm what is my understanding correct that account Jenkins IO, so the old application that helps to manage the accounts on directly on the LDAP database. And also beta and admin that are Two entry point to the same key clock system, a public and a backend one. These applications are still running on our Kubernetes cluster, but they don't have any ingress, which means no one can reach them except the cluster administrator. So we keep the logs of this uh, system, or at least their current behavior. We can still manage us admins, but no one can reach them since everyone worked on that. Can you confirm that I understand uh, correctly? Account uh, the Jenkins .io and beta uh, account Jenkins .io uh, haven't anymore any ingress, but uh, admin the Jenkins .io is still uh, up and running. Okay. And accessible. Just, yeah, it's only available through the private ingress, meaning through the VPN. So it's not admin only for that one. It's everyone with an open access to the Jenkins Infra VPN. It's using what we call the private ingress. But yeah, uh, important to notice because if there is an attack vector through our private machine, still we could have had issues. So the status right now, oh, um, the analysis, I understand that no Jenkins instance is um, subject to the log4g issue because no log4g dependency on Jenkins core or most of the plugin we use. I don't know if there has been a full scale or a scale directly on the virtual machine to see if there isn't um, a, dependent, a transitive dependency of a plugin, Mark. Did we run so that analysis Dan on CI? <clears throat> Daniel ran that analysis on CI on Friday and, oh, cool. and found but no no issue. If done that, I think by analyzing uh, the war file and the dependency file, not on VM and like you are suggesting. Cor correct. Okay. He, you're right. He did not scan the file, or at least as far as I know, he did not scan the file system. That's true. Okay. What he, so what that, he did so was he scanned. On us, then. Just one final task to be sure on the case of CI, given that we have a bunch of plugins that are installed, some might not be used. So better safe than sorry, even though they did a complete analysis from the top. Um, I think there, there are a bunch of um, scanners that we can run on ourselves from the machine, just to be sure that on user local Jenkins, we don't have anything. 
Okay. I guess it's it has to be run on the Jenkins home, not on the Docker image, since they already did the Docker image part. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure they just uh, look at the source code source source code of the plugin on Jenkins. I'm I don't okay. think they. Well, no, I so I definitely ran the. The mitigation from the blog post on ci.jenkins.io yeah. and, and that okay. that is inside that goes inside the groovy script console so it's definitely looking at the running java virtual machine okay um is there a way to persist that change if we have to restart ci jenkins.io if we did the mitigation that happened yeah, the, inside it's the not, it's not a mitigation it's a script to check if uh, <laughs> so ah, sorry, we bad. are vulnerable for, from uh, is there yeah. any right. plugin using log4g the affected version of log4g or log4g okay. to, uh, at short uh, okay I, sh I may have asked before then is there a document even a private one that one of you can share with me because i I wasn't yep. able to find anything about that, and I'm sure there is a bunch of there. Someone wrote all the, this the script. The script uh, to check it is in the Jenkins blog. Uh, yes, or working month. documents that list what has been done everywhere, because I had yep. partial information from different chat channels or yep. issues, and I'm not sure uh, if we have document where we listed that. I, I understand that it was hard, so I'm not saying we should have done that. I'm saying, do you do we have something that, that can do? Read? Yes, cool. I'm, and I'm happy to share that with you, Damien. We've okay. I we definitely kept a log all day Friday of the of the actions we were taking and the observations. So cool. I, I'll have to share that with you. Absolutely. So that means all the Jenkins instance are safe based on all the work you did. Um, that means the only candidates would be accounts and beta and admin. Do uh, I understand that these are the only ones, all the other applications yeah. either are not Java or don't yes. have log 4G, right? Yes, Kicklock isn't uh, affected and uh, isn't I either. Account app uh, doesn't seem so too. Uh, okay. I've searched uh, for yeah. log 4G in the source code and dependency tree and they don't find anything. Cool. Um, where, were we able to run on the, these free services uh, a, a scan on the containers, because these are running on containers on Kubernetes, uh, that check that the, the dependency is not present on the war uh, somewhere as a transitive dependency. So we don't have the dependency from POMXML, but it can come from a transitive dependency. So the 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 assessment that that is done from the script console checks transitive dependencies because transitive dependency jars are also loaded into Jenkins at runtime. And yes, so for, the for, for, for Jenkins, but, but for not for Oh, for Kicklock. with we are taking, um, they issued a, a statement uh, mm -hmm. saying they aren't uh, vulnerable. We okay. not, uh, we didn't uh, went uh, further. And for okay. Acuntap, uh, I've... Uh, so in the case of uh, Acuntap, I saw uh, an analysis from Daniel that we're using log4g1.x. So that means a version before the code that is the infamous code that triggered the GNDI stuff, uh, hasn't been introduced yet. Um, so that means account is so old in the <laughs> that. They got other problem to solve before this one. Exactly. Uh, so based on all the feedbacks uh, you all did, there should be no reason for not putting back uh, this service online. So, so Daniel Beck did have one question. He was asking if accounts.jenkins.io is hosted inside of something else. And I had not done that analysis. Oh. So he was asking about, is it inside a Tomcat or a WebSphere or a Glassfish? Okay. Um, so it's running on a Docker container, uh, which is described on the repository. Let me add the link on the notes. Um, I, I don't remember, but it's on the from. Let me add the link. 
Oh, oh, right. I think we did look at that, didn't we? Sorry. Yeah. Yes. I, I, no, no problem, Mark. We had we had looked at at the Docker image that defines accounts.jenkins.io, and the from was yeah. was yeah. an outdated version of Jetty, if I remember right. Uh, um, okay, it's running inside Jetty. Correct. I, I, uh, I don't know that for sure. Have you have you checked it, Damien? Uh, yes. Uh, just right now, let me add the link. Here is the link. So which version? I don't know. We need to check the last the the builds. Yeah, right. it's yeah. Right? Yes, and that should be in the notes. Yeah. Oh yes, here it is. Okay. So oh nope. Okay, I did the the dependency check in the mm -hmm. in the notes, and there it was only log for j one dot two no two dot x. But the that. That Jetty JRE8, we did the analysis during the meeting, but I don't see it noted here. Sorry about that. So it was no, no that problem. is That's... Jetty colon JRE8 is, if I remember right, about two years old as an image. And so don't know if it's vulnerable. Okay. Uh, let me just run the command uh, with kubectl exec to check the exact version we have. I think that's uh, right now in production, because here we have a, a typical example that we use the latest kind of image on Docker. That means what is exactly inside the image uh, depends on when did we build that image last time. Mm. Um, we cannot fix exactly all the elements on a given image because we want to benefit some from patches. But here in that case, it's factual. That means we need to check in production what we have. I'm currently running the command inside the account app container and I will copy past the command I run uh, to determine the current version of JTN Java. So we, we should be able then to answer back to Daniel. Um, so we can continue on the on that one. So we need to ask to assess there is absolutely no risk on account Jenkins IO before putting it back. So right yes. now. We don't know. Do, do you share the same analysis as mine? I, I, I do not know that that Docker image is free of any, any JDK or any log4j2 instance. Yes, so I don't know that. Um, so we need to validate these versions. Regarding accounts and beta, so these two services, Oh, sorry, beta and admin. So beta is public and admin is private and will be kept private. Um, we have, uh, uh, Harvey, can I uh, mission you to just to share the, the official statement of Keycloak so we can put it on the notes? Not right now, we can do this afterwards. Yeah. Uh, that will be our stump saying, okay, we can put that service back if it's okay for everyone. But okay. that should be OK to put these elements back if we have that confirmation. Can I add a, a scan, a full scan of the, of the um, Docker if, if needed to have a second security, no? Yeah, good point. I propose that we run the Docker, Docker released that uh, scanner analysis on the uh, tool on Docker desktop. So we could try to run a scan on the same exact image checksum that the one we are running in production as a secondary check. So we have uh, uh, from Keycloak something that say, okay, it's okay. And the Docker scan analysis with both, if the, both are positive, we yeah, should we be able to put beta and admin uh, back online or beta. Sounds good for you. We want to take the scanning option. <laughs> Someone with Docker know. desktop. <laughs> I don't know how to say Centur plus Bretel, but that's the word. Better safe than sorry in English. Oh, that's the, that's exactly the same meaning as Centur et Bretel in French. Perfect. Um, are, you, are you interested, Stefan, on running the scan? Since I know you have Docker Desktop, we can help you on finding yeah. the correct one, the that's correct the reference. But are you interested on that part? Oh, yes. Perfect. Okay, 
So Stefan is designed a volunteer for that task, <laughs> at least for the uh, for the bit for the beta image. Yeah. Um, I propose Hervé or Mark. One of, is one of you okay for doing the same with the account Docker image, just to be sure. Yes, if I can get the, uh, how would I, how would I get access? I, so I definitely have Docker Desktop, and I'm happy to run any tools that will help that. Um, how do I find out the exact? How do I get and download the exact image of what's being run for on accounts.jenkins.io? So you, you have the tag of the image defined on the chart configuration file. That should be a first step, and then you will, you should confirm that the full SHA checksum of the image that you have scanned is the same as the one running on AKS cluster. So with a describe pod or get pod, if you export the pod definition, uh, if you're interested, we can do this uh, like we, because we do the same with Stefan. So we can do the three of us and each one of you will then be autonomous to get the correct reference. The difference yeah. is, I don't know if Stefan has direct access while you have Mark. But we can start I'm, the three of us. Yeah, I'm not sure that I'm. I'm. I have, actually, I'm quite sure I'm not confident being using direct access, even if I have it. So yes, <laughs> I would. I would love a session. Okay, so then uh, I will show you that. Unless survey, are you okay to drive that? Mm. Okay. Uh, I'm, sure. uh, <laughs> I, I'm asking just to be sure because that's a learning opportunity for everyone. Even if I do it, oh, I don't. So. Sorry, two minutes, heater issue. Okay. But maybe we uh, don't need to record that part. Right, right. We definitely don't. No, no. That 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 we will end the meeting and then mm -hmm. and then we can do 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 the exploration. Absolutely. So while while Demian's offline, I had opened up the the jetty colon jre8 docker image that i downloaded i'm not 100 percent sure it's the same exact image but i opened it and i see no reference to log for 2j dash core anywhere in it so so that there is there are references to log for 2j log for j2 but not the dash core that um that is that seems to be the the place where the the vulnerability exists now i have not expanded every jar file that's on the system to to do the recursive search so I, it still could be hiding i've put the note uh, the declaration from keyclock in the zoom chat mm, okay So the so the the unpacked jetty user local jetty does not it contains several different many different jars but it does not contain any jar with the name log for j in it. Cool. I'm just locked on the on the zoom screen. No way to see anything else. Yeah. Okay. So I think we are at a point where we could pause, stop the, stop the recording and call it, continue the meeting then without being actively recorded. Any objections? Nope. No. Okay, so I'm 